Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're really, really privileged to be joined by Tim Knight, the president and CEO of the Robert, uh, Robert, Robert R. McCormick Foundation, which is one of the key institutions um, in Illinois. It's a powerhouse in Chicago and a major force in philanthropy across the country. Tim has an interesting background. He's from Flint, Michigan, uh, went to Marquette University as an undergrad, went to DePaul Law School, has been a lawyer in Chicago, had a stint in London as well, uh, came back to Chicago, has had an amazing career at the Chicago Tribune and the Tribune Company, was also the publisher of Newsday. Um, and he's also been a, a real entrepreneur. He was involved in uh, co-founding a firm called Classified Ventures, which created, as I understand it, uh, cars.com and apartments.com, two really innovative uh, websites and businesses. So uh, he's been a, the, the, the president and CEO of the, the MacArthur, uh, excuse me, the McCormick Foundation uh, for about a year, started late March of 2020. So entered just as COVID was descending upon the country, but has really taken the helm of the foundation and is thinking hard about the ways it can be uh, even more powerful and strategic in Chicago and Illinois. So with that, Tim, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to see you. Great to see you, John. Thanks for having me here. Great. Well, Tim, let's talk about growing up in Flint, Michigan. I know you're one of six kids. Uh, your dad, I think, was a Marquette alum, was a dentist. Tell us about kind of the early years in Flint and then how you ended up at Marquette. Sure. So I had a you know great uh, classic Midwestern, smallish town uh, uh, growing up. Uh, it was terrific. Uh, for high school, I went to a, a Catholic high school, which was the only one in the county. It was in uh, downtown Flint and kind of north end of Flint, which is you know a very economically challenged area. So it was my first exposure to you know, not only uh, uh, the diversity that the city has to offer, but a lot of the challenges that in parts of the city that, you know, where I was growing up, I, I didn't get to see as much. Uh, and so really learned, you know, more and more given the kind of the, the uh, uh, Catholic uh, faith-based giving back ethos, you know, how we got involved in the community. Uh, but in watched Flint go from a, a town that was the you know headquarters or founding of General Motors, real power in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, 70s, economic, many people going into the middle class through having these jobs in the uh, factory to watching it be overtaken by competition and the city slowly shrinking. So it really gave me, I didn't realize it then, but a really good idea of you know, the issues that we face uh, in Chicago, especially on the South and West sides, how the communities need to be invested in for the long term. So it was a, it was a, it was a great childhood and I was very privileged, I had a great mother and father. Well, and then as I understand it, you, uh, you maybe were working for your dad's in your dad's dental, dental office and uh, found that you really liked the, the, the numbers, the bookkeeping, the accounting, and that actually sort of informed your decision to study accounting at Marquette and kind of take you in that direction. It, it did. Uh, I found out I had really bad eye-hand coordination, so yeah. being a dentist was not going to work uh, and, and did like the numbers really well. And when I went off to uh a college became an accounting major. And when I went to law school, uh, I, we knew two lawyers growing up. One was a criminal defense lawyer. I didn't want to do that. And the other was my dad's tax lawyer who seemed to have a pretty good life. And so if I had followed my initial inclination, I would be a tax lawyer in Flint, Michigan right now, as opposed to doing what I'm doing. So it's the, the benefit of being open-minded about career opportunities. And then you started, it was Scan, Scan & Arts was a firm, uh, and it has, I think it's a New York-based firm, has a big presence in Chicago. You worked there for a while, and then you worked overseas, as I understand it, and then came back to Chicago and started with the Tribune. And tell us about, you know, your early years with the Tribune, what that, uh, what that involved. Sure. So uh, I, I was coming back from London. Uh, London was supposed to be, for Scadden, was supposed to be a three-month summer assignment. I stayed two years because it was, you know, very open-ended and a lot of great opportunity. And traveled all over doing work, mainly in Eastern Europe in the middle 90s, doing privatization work following the collapse of the wall. So a lot of interesting work there, but decided, wanted to get back to Chicago, wanted to stay in the Midwest, really didn't have a path with my law firm to do that. So, uh, you know, by happenstance, got hired by Tribune 
as the mergers and acquisition lawyer. And Tribune at the time was doing a lot in digital investments, right? So they had made an early investment in what became AOL and it paid off handsomely for the company. So they were reinvesting that. And uh, what within a year, I was assigned to help create Classified Ventures, which was an idea that the, the strong automotive recruitment in real estate advertising that supported the paper that allowed to fund the journalism, if you will, was going to be, you know, this thing called the internet and digital was going to come in and really wreak havoc on that, that revenue stream. And so how do we essentially create a business that would help us continue to fund journalism? And that was the whole idea in the late 90s, early 2000s was like, what are these new revenue streams that can support the, the journalistic mission long term? And the Tribune Company, I mean, it's, it's such an, an important institution in Chicago. I mean, I, talk about, you know, sort of the relationship between the Chicago Tribune and the Tribune Company, which I, as I presume also runs WGN TV and radio. Tell us about that larger entity. Sure. So, so late 90s, early 2000s, as you said, uh, Tribune Company was, you know, a leading uh, media company in the in the country, and probably you know in some ways the world uh, didn't have international, but all over the United States. Um, initially, four newspapers, two in Florida, Chicago, and one small one in Virginia, and um, growing TV presence. Right, so consolidation was going on in the broadcast area, and then it had an education division. So it was taking the money that the newspapers and TV stations and reinvesting it. The digital part was the, the essentially the fourth leg of a stool, if you will. Um, and it was, you know, how do you grow to be, we, we believe in consolidation in media, which is what has happened. And how do you be a consolidator? And then in, in 2000, Tribune acquired the Times Mirror Company, LA Times, and, you know, got very big, dot com bust. So there's a lot of changes going on. So the the early 2000s was, if you if you look back, was where media really, you know, kind of fragmented and then came together in different ways. You have cable, so you, now you have Comcast and Charter and the cable operators. Um, Google wasn't even around, so Google, Microsoft, Microsoft for a long time, we thought was going to be our biggest competitor. Uh, they were trying to do a lot of things in local media. Uh, so it was just a real, you know, great time to be in that business. Um, and the Chicago Tribune was, you know, extraordinarily successful. A lot of Pulitzer Prizes, hard-hitting journalism, was the flagship paper of the company, and really did a, uh, it, it continues to be a really important institution in Chicago and the Midwest. Now, what is the relationship between the McCormick uh, Foundation and the Tribune Company, ap apart from the fact that you're both, in some sense, kind of progeny? Of Colonel McCormick. I mean, was there is there always been kind of a symbiotic relationship between the two? They're they're independent uh, organizations, obviously. But a lot of the uh, Colonel McCormick, when he passed away in 1955 and created a trust, which has become the foundation, uh, you wanted to, to be uh, focused on you know the people of Illinois. So we have Cantini Park, and then helping you know families, childrens, and and veterans were some of the areas he outlined, and. The board of the foundation historically was made up of executives from the Tribune Company, right? Who who knew the colonel either in the early days, or people who knew people who knew the colonel, and so it was really implementing his uh, ideals and principles in the grant making. And the the major asset for a long time of the foundation was the stock of Tribune Company, and as as that was successful, the foundation became very successful as well and had more money to grant. Well, I want to read just a couple sentences from your mission statement, and maybe you can drill down a little bit because you've, you've kind of alluded to it, but it reads to work with communities in Chicago land and across Illinois to develop educated, informed, and engaged citizens. Our aim is to assist communities to strengthen democracy and help ensure that all families and children have the opportunities they need to flourish. Deconstruct that as to sure. what, 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 what that means in kind of practice for you. Sure. So as we're as we're moving forward now, and we're actually looking at tightening that up even more, uh, the mission and the vision of what we want to have uh, go on, where we, we see where we see we can have an important contribution. So it, it does center around communities and communities that have been underinvested in, and uh, we believe strongly that um, 
the United States is the best country in the world and has offers all people a lot of opportunity and they can fulfill whatever destiny they have, but not everybody starts at the, with the same uh, level of opportunities. And so how do we make the playing field slightly more even by giving resources to communities that uh, can use the investments? So we're focused on um, early education and research has shown that strong early educational development uh, and being ready for kindergarten and doing well on your third grade math and reading scores really is a great uh, 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 proxy for long-term educational success. And we believe that a strong educational system uh, is a path to, you know, call it better wage jobs and, and family wealth. Uh, we're starting to look more closely at investments in communities. And so we focus on two primary communities, a little village, which is a Hispanic community, uh, uh, heavily um, immigrant, uh, from Mexico, and in Englewood, which is a, a African American community, so we we are looking at programs to support the communities there. We have partners. We we are driven by what the part the community's vision is for their community. It's not our vision, and so how do we help invest there? And then we partner with United Way and ten other communities as well in on the south and west side and some of the suburban, uh, essentially suburban areas around Chicago. Uh, we have a strong commitment to veterans. Um, given the colonel, given the colonel was a colonel, and in his will he talked about the widows and orphans of veterans and those who might have fallen in harder times. And so we helped create a essentially an infrastructure for the state of Illinois uh, called Illinois Joining Forces that helps navigate. So helps uh, people as they leave the military or have been out of the military for a while and our veterans navigate the services that are available to them and working with service providers to know how they can help veterans differently. Uh, and then we've been very involved in, you know, journalism and civic education as well, amongst other things. Right. I wanted to read something from your website on, on your approach to grant making, which struck me as, is really quite interesting. You say we're committed to having measurable systemic impact on the areas we invest in and holding ourselves accountable for these results. Mm -hmm. Drill down on that a little bit in terms of just the, the ability to have measurable and systemic um, impact. So it, it's not without its challenges, right? Uh, but what, we, what we've been doing is, so we, we help fund um, an aggregation of a variety of data sources of, for different communities around Chicago. That gives us essentially a benchmark and for us to take a look and when we work with communities, share that information, uh, whether it's uh, graduation rates, um, uh, healthcare disparities, educational um, attainment, wh whatever it is, uh, let's, let's have, let's understand where we are and what does the community want as far as improvement and then how do we help invest on that. And when we think about systemic, it's, it's a combination of direct service so how do you handle the need, but how do you make some investments in the longer term? We're very patient, we're gonna be around forever. So we can, take the, we can take a very long view of investments and be patient to have that pay off for the communities. We had a, an interview about a year ago, I think with Angelique Power from the Field <laughs> Foundation. And, and they had kind of an innovation in terms of mapping in which they tried to kind of drill down on you know areas and just find out you know where is you know where are the educational challenges where are the crime challenges that sort of thing I mean that seems somewhat related very, to what you're yeah very similar and we we know their work and we're trying to share more work um, we're in the process right now of of mapping the communities we're in on even a more of a micro and understanding essentially what block every school is on where are there early education centers where are there other uh, community institutions in those uh, neighborhoods? How far, are the, how far are they from transportation? Where's the retail corridor? Because the more data you gather, and, and I find mapping to be really a great way to get people's head around what's the data saying as opposed to just being kind of the, the raw information. Right. Now, you also have an innovative program on community justice. And I know that part of your concern has been historically or recently just gun violence in Chicago, which has always been a serious problem 
particularly in the South and West sides. I think also you've been very interested in criminal justice reform to make sure that, uh, that people are not incarcerated sort of forever for relatively minor offenses and so forth. Talk a little bit about the community justice piece that you're, you're working on. Sure, I would say there's, there's two primary prongs uh, that we're focused on and a couple of uh, secondary. So primary would be, I would say, is street outreach programs. There, there's a body in other communities, in Los Angeles and New York in particular, where uh, engaging, you know, uh, programs that engage people who've been involved in uh, uh, criminal activities and, and are reformed come and help the community. So if there's a shooting, they help you know, keep the peace afterwards and not have retaliation. And they help outreach, especially during the summer. So a number of street outreach programs, there's one CP4P, um, Communities Partnering for Peace, and then the READY program uh, through two uh, institutions in Chicago, Metropolitan Family Services and Heartland Alliance. And we're engaged with both of them around a handful of communities in Chicago on the south and west side, but, but focusing even more on Little Village and Englewood, our, our primary communities. Um, there's also you know, a number of, you know, I think the number is 25,000 people leave the Department of Corrections every year and go back to their communities. And oftentimes they're disadvantaged in that they don't have a clear place to live. They don't have a driver's license that's active. There's challenges for them to get employment, get housing. And so uh, we're looking more about essentially call it re-entry work to help those um, people who've, who've paid their debt to society get reassimilated into their communities and uh, be able to live successful uh, lives going forward. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, you know, there are different programs uh, that are out there that, on how we might uh, keep people from getting engaged in the criminal justice system to begin with. And so it really focusing on at really high risk youth and making sure that they get the counseling and the help they need so that they don't get put into the, the criminal justice system. Well, you guys have been historically very active in democracy programs. And I know that what the Institute has worked with you on, on some initiatives, particularly concerning civics and education. Talk about, I know you have a really interesting uh, uh, democracy schools initiative that has kind of wide reach throughout the state of Illinois. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. And then also just the, the really powerhouse work you've done on civics education, pushing through I think a, a new law a couple of years ago to, to introduce a requirement and I think in middle school. Sure, so let's take the last one first. Um, so the, the, uh, our, civic, our democracy leadership, uh, I guess five years ago now focused on passing legislation to have a high school, a high school civic education requirement that passed. We helped fund the implementation, training teachers on, on the curriculum, how they can get credentialed and improve their skills to be able to teach um, quality civics education to high schoolers. As you mentioned a couple of years ago, similar legislation down to the middle school grades, and that's being implemented right now. Um, democracy schools is something that was started you know, 15 years ago and was unique, and I'll talk about where it is right now, unique for us because it took particular schools and what I would say is it just really schools that run really well and have the right type of leadership, which is key with the principal and with the social studies teachers. And they're really committed to engaging the students and helping the students understand how uh, they can participate in debate and discussion around issues that they face. Uh, and so we have 63 democracy schools as a program to get certified. Um, what we did this past year is we partnered with the DuPage office, Regional Office of Education and made multi-year grants to them. And they're running actually both of those programs now. Um, they had more infrastructure and were really committed not only to the democracy schools in DuPage, but across the state. So they're, they're overseeing the democracy schools program for us now. So we're in the middle of transitioning that as well as uh, helping with the middle school uh, civic implementation work. So found a great partner, which is one of the things, you know, we, we've done in the past, which is, you know, we, we, we hear people have an idea, we put some money, time, effort, and uh, human resources against it, but ultimately we want to nurture it so that it can be sustainable and have uh, somebody that has 
the the uh, institutional commitment to continue that work and DuPage is, is doing that for us in those two areas right now. Great. Tell us a little bit about the park. Cantigny, I don't know if I pronounced that right because it's this apparent, I mean, I've just seen the photographs, this beautiful park out in uh, uh, Wheaton. I think there's a golf course and all sorts of facilities. Tell us about that, how that sure. developed. I think that was actually Colonel McCormick's uh, kind of um, Oh. weekend residence was yeah. that how he uh, how he weekend <laughs> yes 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 so uh it, so it's pronounced cantini so the okay. g is silent so cantini uh was is a town in france and it was where the uh first infantry division had its first battle in the first world war that the colonel participated in and so you know he inherited the home from his mother who inherited from her father who was joseph medill the uh, for whom the Medill School of Journalism is named for, but also was the uh, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, big supporter of Abraham Lincoln. So that was, it was called Red Oaks at first, Cantini, 500 acre estate, uh, left in a, uh, another, another trust that became a foundation that we oversee um, for the benefit of the people of Illinois. So uh, what we have is the uh, Colonel's family home, which we're actually in the middle of renovating, updating after, you know, 75 years of, of not being updated. Um, he also instructed the trustees to create a, uh, a museum for the military museum for the first division, which we have. So there's the first division museum on the campus. And we now have a visitor center, uh, you know, a couple hundred acres of beautiful parks. We just went through a multi-year re-landscaping. So it is, a, it is an oasis, it is beautiful. Uh, and as you mentioned about 30 years ago plus now, uh, the foundation invested in a 27 hole golf course. And the idea is, you know, uh, country club quality for the public. And so uh, we have that is a beautiful golf course with a, with a very well-recognized uh, golf academy. So the golf course was just um, in Golf Digest, uh, top 30 in Illinois. Uh, the academy is well-recognized as a top 50. There's a great youth organization. So if you're in the Western suburbs, it is a great place to uh, go and visit. And it's become a venue for uh, the whole park for uh, weddings and different events, family reunions. And uh, so we've been very busy post COVID. Um, you know, the Colonel had a polo field on it at one time and had a airstrip and he would fly his plane from Cantini downtown to go to work and then go back for lunch. <laughs> when he wanted. And he piloted himself to Miggs Field in Chicago. So, um, you know, great, great connection with the city, but it, it's a beautiful place. And it is the only charge we have is for parking uh, to get in, and otherwise it's it's free to everybody in the state. Great. Well, Tim, let's talk about just sort of you know the the, uh, the management challenge you faced. I mean, you came in. I think your predecessor was there for about a decade or so and did great work. You know, the foundation is this you know powerhouse in the state, the you know the, the city, the the country. Um, as you entered, how have you tried to kind of shape uh, the foundation? I know you've been involved in strategic planning. Tell us about just the discipline of strategic planning and how it, as it pertains to the foundation. Sure, so a, a brief history. Um, the foundation for a, a you know, couple of decades had what was called a communities program. And so uh, worked with TV stations, newspapers, sports teams around the country. Some were Tribune, some were not Tribune. Uh, where those entities would use their essentially promotional power, fundraising power to raise money from the public and the foundation would match uh, 50 cents in the dollar raised and then work with uh, the essentially the, the local organization to grant to the local communities. So it had a very large program there. Um, the board and, and David Hiller, my predecessor, uh, as, uh, you know, kind of time went on, saw during this, you know, probably middle of you know, the 2015 era, that Chicago, which is our hometown, uh, is where the, it was the Colonel's hometown, it's where his commitment was, needed a lot more focus. And right, so, so we, we unwound a lot of our community programs, all of our community programs outside of uh, Chicago and Illinois, and really tripled down, I would say, on what can we do in Chicago and in, in the process has been about identifying what are the needs and where, where consistent with 
you know, our mission, vision, the kernel's ideals and principles, where can we have the most impact? And, and that's where we are now. So we're, we're tightening up our focus. As I mentioned, it is heavy in the south and west side. We're looking at, you know, how we help in uh, with it, longer term investments in around economic opportunity. So how do you help businesses get created in local communities? How do you help the, the uh, economic corridors get developed? There's a lot of money from the state, a lot of money from the city, a lot of American rescue plan type government assistance coming through. So how are the communities able to take advantage of that? So we're, we're extremely focused on our role in that area uh, and, and tied to our community justice work, which you referred to, uh, the education work, which I mentioned before. So how does it all come together um, to help these local communities? You know, how can we help them advance their agenda? Um, continue to really think, I think the evolution about journalism, you know, the last 20 years has seen a complete uh, uh, disruption of the traditional, traditional journalistic model. I know firsthand running newspaper, comp the holding company and running newspapers the, just the, the, the revenue model is just, you know, it's, it's obliterated. So it's much more about engaging consumers. Uh, it's a digital focused. And so we look at grants to mainly nonprofits who are, are doing strong investigative solution journalism, uh, holding government accountable. We, we think that's a really important function of the traditional newspaper that is essentially being lost as that model goes away. Uh, and so, you know, notwithstanding all of the challenges with social media and, uh, you know, kind of the polarization of the country, you know, wh where can we help, uh, wh where are investments we can make uh, to not-for-profits that bring people together in, a in advance a civic agenda uh, for Chicago, for Illinois, and, importantly, have civil discourse. I mean, we're uh, all struck by sometimes the, the lack of, uh, of uh, decorum in conversations. And so we're, we're really brainstorming now about how we use Cantini, how we use the, when the house is renovated, what else can um, McCormick do to really have people have uh, a dialogue and disagree without being disagreeable. And, and try to advance solutions as opposed to finger pointing. Well, you've had a really wide ranging career, but I guess in some sense, this is like your first direct um, immersion in the world of philanthropy. What, uh, what are your impressions? What has surprised you? Uh, what encourages you? What troubles you about philanthropy, maybe more broadly and specifically as it pertains to Chicago and Illinois? So I, I start with there are uh, more philanthropic organizations than I knew existed, <laughs> uh, it, which is which is great, and there are because there's a uh, wide range of needs that have to be addressed. Um, it, everyone has their own um, specific either point of view or area of interest because there are these. Well, some of the foundations, and we're a large foundation. It's not, you know, our. our ability to spend is, you know, outstripped by the, the need, right? So, so we need to prioritize and pick the areas where we can have the most impact. We'd like to coordinate with others where it makes sense. So, so you can maximize the uh, impact of the investments. And to our point earlier, have measurable outcomes and try to understand what you're, you know, be clear what you're trying to achieve. You might be wrong, but if you have, you have to have some type of milestone and goal, otherwise you're just kind of meandering. Um, I, I think it's, uh, I think there's there's nothing, I don't think anything surprising about uh, philanthropy. Uh, um, it's, uh, you know, very smart people uh, who want to make a difference in the world. And so I think that idealism is, is wonderful and can be very infectious. Uh, the best part of this job for me is getting to know, and it goes back to the, your first question about my upbringing, is the getting to know the people in the communities who have committed themselves to making a difference in that, those communities, who um, you know, wake up every day and try to figure out how they can get different businesses to open up or locate in a particular neighborhood, how they can work with the police and the city 
to address the gun violence and other issues there, how they can make sure that their kids have the educational opportunities that each one of us as a parent wants to have. So uh, it's really, really important that, you know, we, we do that well. And so I'm, you know, I'm privileged to be able to have this job and, and work with the communities to do that. Well, when this opportunity came up, I'm wondering, did you think, okay, this, this kind of connects to everything else I've done, or is it like, I'm about to enter a whole new world and I need to reinvent myself or, or probably some mix of both. It probably a mix of both. Um, you know, I, I knew, you know, David Hiller, my predecessor and I worked together at the Tribune. We're very good friends. Uh, I knew uh, I was a, when I ran Newsday and, and at the Chicago Tribune, we were partners with the McCormick Foundation and our, our local charity operation. So I was very familiar with it, probably more so on Long Island when I was running the newspaper and we had a very large presence in our Newsday charities with the McCormick Foundation. Um, and we had, you know, different uh, fun, you know, kind of fundraising activities there. Uh, for me, it's um, almost like a culmination of a lot of, as you, as you, you know, listed my background, it is, it is not linear at all. And so it's somewhat eclectic. And I think that this is essentially a, a culmination of a lot of it. It's, you know, running a foundation is running a business. Uh, it's, you know, there's, you know, it's a big organization. We have, you um, uh, people, we have a, an endowment we have to manage well. We're in for the long term. I have a board that I report to. I we have our I have our colleagues that I need to align and motivate and help support and develop. And so those skills I have for running the businesses, but it's the you know how do we take those activities, those people, those resources, and really have the most impact in the communities that we're trying to serve. What is it we want to do, and how do we get it done? We're We've been around for 65 years. The next decade is, you know, I think a pivotal time for the country, for the city. And I think we're positioned well to help, um, you know, advance some, some agendas if we can. How has COVID affected the foundation? Well, I mean, as you noted, I took over uh, the end of March. So, so I, I briefly met my colleagues in early March, right before the shutdown in like a one hour meet and greet, both here, both downtown and at Cantini. And then, you know, got to know everybody via Zoom, right? And I, I had used Zoom like five times before in my professional career, but not, not as intimately as I learned how to use it now. Uh, so I think for me, leading an organization, new executive, new, um, you know, area. So it wasn't like running a newspaper. So it was different. Philanthropy was different. Uh, a, a learning curve, but jumped in and in, in some ways even better because we were really focused on COVID and how do we help our communities with COVID. So we immediately, especially after the um, so, uh, unrest in the summer, you, you even doubled down on COVID impact and how do we help communities rebuild. So uh, two big areas we focused on was essentially the businesses in Little Village and Englewood and, and each one uh, through the Chambers of Commerce and some of the other organizations, we granted uh, 1.5 million between the two of them to help small businesses, all about small businesses, fixing the windows that were broken, buying inventory, helping figure out how you can take advantage of different government options, PPP, et cetera. So, COVID for us was very, it, it forced us to focus our efforts even more. And I think we can, you know, really came together and aligned even remotely, which is what we did as a, as a team. And the board was extraordinarily engaged and supportive. We had regular conversations with them. And our mantra, because it's much like the Colonel, if you read about the Colonel, it was about action. So we're we're not about a lot of words, we're about doing things. And so we, we put a lot of money to work really fast. Tim, we've had a couple of questions emailed in and I'd like to read them to you. The first comes from Catherine from Chicago who wants to know about the ongoing role and responsibility of the nonprofit community uh, to ensure and uh, engage and inform citizen culture in our communities, both in Chicago and statewide. So uh, great question. Uh, Obviously, you know, as I mentioned, education, you know, kind of the educational system, you know, the, the civic education, trying, you know, driving people to understand, you know, why, why do we have the particular government structure we do? How does it compare to um, other structures? Uh, while not perfect, 
it's our opinion is the best that's out there as, as Churchill would say. Um, so continuing that prong. And then, as I mentioned, we are, and I don't have the answer to it. I don't think, I'm not sure anyone does on, you know, essentially how does, uh, how, what's the next model of journalism that helps hold government accountable to do what it's supposed to do. And one of our, you know, we're not in gotcha. Uh, we don't like gotcha journalism, gotcha investigations. What we're like, what we want is deep, thoughtful investigations with, and we're looking for partners who can identify solutions that government officials should consider to help benefit communities, the city, the, uh, the public safety aspects of it, whatever it might be. But we need um, people to think about solutions and take action against those. And, but, but there's a lot of, I think the next, it'll be interesting, there's a lot of money flowing, especially uh, the federal stimulus money and the recovery money that bad things can happen with that much money flowing around. And so how do you make sure that it gets to the right people, that it's done equitably, and that it's helping the people it's supposed to help and not being used for inappropriate ways? Okay. Jennifer from Chicago playing off that says, please provide your insights about the mass exodus of journalists during the Tribune buyout and more broadly, the consolidation of the media in the United States. So if you want to take the broader question uh, or, or however you'd like to respond to that. Yeah. So I would, it's a, um, so I, uh, I think one can look at just a handful of media and we'll stay, we'll stay with newspapers for now. Newspaper, historic newspaper companies, uh, the Journal, the Times, the Washington Post, which reinvented itself under Bezos, as being able to have a long-term sustainable for-profit model. I, I don't know the financials of the Post really, but you can, you can see both the Journal and the Times because they're either public companies or owned by public companies. Um, Others who do great work, my old place, Newsday, Minneapolis Star Tribune, uh, Los Angeles Times are owned by wealthy individuals who probably run it at, at, better, at best break even, maybe a slight, you know, maybe a slight loss, maybe a slight profit, um, but are in, it's, it's committed to the long term and they um, continue to staff strongly uh, the, their journalism. And importantly, in this dynamic we're in, and always, they need to be serving their community well, otherwise people won't subscribe to it, whether it's in print or digital. And so I think that is what you're going to see survive. Um, you know, in Chicago, unfortunately, for the Tribune, it's owned by a hedge fund, which has a different business model um, and I don't think anyone has a clear idea of what their long-term goal is. Um, but I think for people at the Chicago Tribune, you know, the journalists, they, they were offered an option that probably will only come once as far as a, a um, severance package that re reflected their multiple years of service. So you saw a lot of the more senior journalists taking that. And that is nothing, I mean, they should do that. They have families and they have other things they need to consider. And, it's, and uh, I respect all of them um, for, for their contributions to the journalism, but it, it's, I think Chicago is gonna be challenged, which is why we're really looking at what, what are um, entities we, not, mainly not-for-profits we can invest in that have the scale, scope, and impact long-term to fill that void. We have a question from Dawn from Pickneyville, which is down in Southern Illinois. And she, she asked more broadly about the role of philanthropy in rural communities, what you can do uh, to, to kind of ease life, ease transitions, provide opportunities. Talk about just how you view the kind of Illinois urban rural uh, kind of dichotomy. Uh, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest that I am not uh, that well versed in it. I, I do follow a little bit the community foundations that are around the state and essentially around the country. I think those are you know, very good models. Um, obviously there's private philanthropy in a lot of these smaller communities, but I think the community foundations uh, can have a real strong impact. Our, 
you know, our statewide work um, with, with respect to this particular question, separate from our work in education, which is kind of more systemic around the entire state, but um, on early education would be in our, our veterans work and in, in the investments we made with Illinois Joining Forces and some of our other partners in the veterans work to, to focus on rural veterans. But uh, we focus mainly in you know, the greater Chicagoland area as opposed to the broader state. Well, Tim, we have a lot of students watching and, and you know, you've had this remarkably interesting, diverse career. I mean, what advice would you give to students as they are approaching uh, their professional careers in terms of, of taking chances, uh, sort of focusing interests? I mean, what, what have you learned over your career that you would, uh, you would tell students as they think about their careers? Uh, so I was a late bloomer to being a good student, right? So what I would say is uh, if, you, if you haven't graduated yet, start early and study hard. And it is about a, a ton of effort. And, and so, I mean, you know, that's long hours. And so I worked at a very large, uh, impactful law firm. And, you know, it was a lot of long hours but I, I was willing to raise my hand to do things, to learn. And when given a chance to, uh, I, I worked for a while for, a, I double duty as a, an associate. And then I worked out at a client's, you know, part-time too. So learned a lot there, right? And a lot of people didn't want to do it. It thought it was, you know, where was it going to go? Learned a lot, uh, raised my hand to go to London, it's supposed to be three months, stay two years, there, raised my hand to go to India uh, to try to work on a project in India. We worked on it all through Eastern Europe uh, in the mid 90s, you know, great opportunity. Raised my hand at uh, for cars.com and apartments.com. So it really is, you know, just taking chances, I guess, right? And being open and knowing they're all not going to work out. Some of mine have not worked out as well as I had hoped they would. But you know, if you apply yourself and, you know, you treat people fairly, it's a small world. Yeah, I mean, you come back to the people you are, you know, you deal with early in your career, you will deal with late in life more likely than not, even in a big city like Chicago. Um, so treating people well, taking chances, working hard. It's, I, I think that's paid off for me and uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate so far. Well, I see a very ample bookshelf behind you. What sort yeah. of things do you like to read? What are your areas of interest? So I like to read a lot of history and it read, I, I read a lot of World War II history because I, I find it fascinating. Uh, uh, some historical fiction, um, you know, because essentially, you know, spy-like novels as well, uh, getting into some, some broader fiction now, but mainly historical biographies. I like to read about the presidents, even the obscure ones. And, you know, there's a lot, so there's a lot of, um, you know, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, uh, Abraham Lincoln, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's one, it takes me away. Others, it, it puts things in perspective. So I'm, uh, I long term, much like Warren Buffett, never bet against America, and, and I believe in that. So you you, you read about um, Andrew Jackson's election and kind of the the fight they had with uh, John Quincy Adams and what happened in the country at that time. We will get through this, right? We will get through the challenges we have, and uh, it may be challenge, we may be painful, it may not be perfect, but. If we're, I think that, uh, we come together as a country, we can do great things and the world needs us, so. Do you have a favorite author that, uh, or, or who are some of your favorite uh, authors? Uh, or is it more topical that- Yeah, I mean, I mean, the ones that I, I've read that I've enjoyed, you know, uh, um, Stephen Ambrose and Doris Kearns Goodwin on, on their right. work, essentially biographies of, of famous people and making it come to life uh, very much um, on, uh, you know, some of the uh, more things that take you, the kind of beachy novels is, you know, there's a guy named Vince Flynn who's actually passed away, but some of his books about, um, you know, CIA type stuff was interesting. Well, finally, Tim, tell us a little bit about how you like to relax. I mean, you, we were talking about reading, but I know you have, I think, two sons. Yep. Um, what, uh, I know you're a big uh, Marquette fan, and we were talking a little bit about the NBA and the city of Milwaukee and, and all, but tell us how you like to unwind uh, uh, when you have a chance. 
So, so I have, as you noted, I have two sons, a 15 year old and a 12 year old, both who like golf and tennis. And so I spent a lot of time just with them. Right. And so, uh, we're fortunate to be able to, you know, get out and, and play golf. They're both now can do better than I. And uh, so it's, it's wonderful to just spend time with them on the golf course. And then we travel and we just, we love taking road trips. We drive a lot, don't fly as much. And that can have its challenges, but it also shows you great parts of the country when we stop and meander and do different things. We did a wonderful spring break about three years ago from Memphis uh, through Birmingham, Alabama, down to New Orleans. And it was, you know, very much on the civil rights trail and looking at the different um, museums now and, and uh, mon monuments and parks uh, that talk about the civil rights era as part of just, you know, teaching the kids of the history of the country and A, how fortunate we are to be living in the, the century we are living in. Well, my wife and I just got back from 10 days in South Dakota and Wyoming and saw a part of the country we never thought we would go to and you know mount rushmore and the black hills and the badlands so we were there we were there over the fourth of july so we oh is that right yes yeah, yeah, so wow we just we just met we got back just before that so that's yeah, so it was great it was a be so beautiful part of the country and the crazy horse monument and there's it was very inspirational there too yeah, well, we spent a, a day at the Crazy Horse. And the one question we never got answered is how long is it going to take them to actually finish this monument? Because have, I, I think a century. So <laughs> that's, that's <not>. right. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time. It's really been delightful to learn about you and, and, the, and the foundation. And, you know, when circumstances allow, we'd love to visit you to Southern Illinois and maybe speak to students and uh, the community and tell them about the good work that you're doing and really... Uh, and, and kind of explain the, uh, the McCormick uh, Foundation to the people down here. Sounds great. Thanks, John. Thanks for your time and uh, really enjoyed it and look forward to thanks. seeing you in person. Perfect. I do too. Thanks so much. Right. Uh -huh. And Bye -bye. thanks to all of you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We will have a video of this conversation on our website tomorrow. Please look at it, pass it on to family and friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the, the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.